Uh, good evening, everyone. I see everyone's filing in. I see some names as we go by. I see Jason, Harlan, Paul, Georgette's here. It's good to see some familiar names. Uh, too many. I've already lost track of all the names of the people I've seen before, but it's good to have everyone here. We'll just give a few moments as everyone logs in. I see Michael. There's a lot of Michaels, though. I see Mike and Michael. A lot of you I know, but there's so many of the same name. I'm just going to say Mike and Michael. Uh, uh, let's see. Who else do we have here? Um, Good to see everyone. We have Tom. Good to see everyone coming in here. And again, we'll give everyone just a few moments to uh, file in as the uh, waiting room opens up and we get everyone situated. Very excited to have everyone. Hope everyone's summer is going well. We have Katarina and Clifford coming in. Hope everyone's having a nice start to their summer, unless you happen to be coming from the Southern Hemisphere, in which case I hope you're enjoying your winter. I know we do often have people from the Southern Hemisphere, so I hope everyone's enjoying whatever season you're in. How about we'll do it that way? All right. So, oh, Dusty's here. Good to see you too. Not see, I'm not going to see anybody. It really, really sucks. Hopefully, soon enough, we will be seeing each other in person. So, first things first, people who used to come in person back when that was a thing, you all know that I like to always start the meetup with who is hiring. Of course, we can't exactly do that right now because I can't, in fact, it's not even capable for people to jump in here and shout. So I'd like everyone to do, if you're looking to hire someone, go into the NY Hacker Slack and in the job postings channel, post your job. This meetup has been great for the past 11 years, getting people jobs. As you know, 12 years now, it's been great at getting people jobs. Uh, all throughout the years, I've had some people here in the chat room who I know got jobs through the meetup. I'm talking a decade ago, I know they got jobs. So if you want to hire someone, one of these many talented people at this group, go to the job postings channel and post your job there and make sure you include a link so people can apply. We'd love to have as many people here getting more jobs as possible. Um, one of the uh, lucky things for me is that since I am on screen, I get to announce that I am hiring. I will uh, take that opportunity. I'm hiring three roles. We are looking for a data scientist, a salesperson, and a Linux sysadmin uh, with um, familiarity with mostly Ubuntu, but Red Hat's useful also. So if you're looking for any of these three roles, data scientist, sales, or Linux sysadmin, talk to me. You know how to find me. Um, find me on Slack, find me on email, find me on Twitter, find me anywhere I'm around. Easy to find. So everyone, post jobs. Next up, those of you who've been coming in person and even the past few year virtually know that we're all about the pizza here. Mine has not arrived yet. So I have this beautiful slice coming from Dominic's Pizza right here. I hold it upside down to show you the cheese lock. I'll show you the bottom. Um, hope everyone's enjoying the pizza you have. Wherever you have it coming from, sound off in the chat. Let me know where you got your pizza from or your other snack that you're having instead of pizza because you're like that. That's cool. A few other events we have coming up where there will all be pizza involved because you know you, you folks know how I am. Uh, starting tomorrow, and it's uh, sold out, um, but I like telling people about it because we do it every year, the STAN workshop. We've been doing this for, I want to say, like seven years or something. It's been a very long time. It's, um, uh, it's a three-day workshop with the team behind the STAN language to do Bayesian analysis. Jonah Gabry is going to be leading, and we have Andrew Gelman appearing, and um, Rob Tranguchi and Scott Spencer all coming to teach us class. We do it every year, and the money goes to pay for, for further STAN development. So we are very excited for that. We'll do it again next year, uh, maybe sometime in between. It is sold out, but we are excited to be doing it. Um, I see there's a question, I think, from Sean about cheese lock, what cheese lock is. Um, so everybody just slices a pizza and the cheese comes sliding right off because it's not attached. Cheese lock is where the cheese stays in place. And believe it or not, the big pizza chains do a lot of like chemical research about this to figure out how they're going to make it work. And smaller pizzerias often do it by having your good pizzeria where you can see the sauce that allows the water to evaporate, meaning the cheese will hold on tightly. So there's, there's cheese lock for you. Next month, still virtual, we have our meetup. I don't have the date yet because I forgot to write it down. We have a date. I forgot to write it down, though. Ian Cook will be giving a talk. Uh, so we're very excited to have Ian Cook virtually with us in August. We will be announcing that hopefully by Friday maybe by Monday, but either way, stay tuned, August, someday in August, we will be doing that. Then September, we are really, really, really excited for September. It is our return to live. 
at least partially, depending on what we could find. I'll explain that all. So we have our seventh annual New York R Conference coming up September 9th through 10th. It's gonna be two days of R fun. We have some really great speakers. Um, some of them are even in this room right now, virtually in this room. Uh, speakers you've heard of, it's gonna be a really fun time. Um, September 9th through 10th. We have workshops associated with that conference on September 1st. This is the first year we split it across two different weeks. Uh, so workshops from the likes of David Robinson, Malcolm Barrett, Lucy D'Agostino, I'm forgetting her last name. I'm sorry, Lucy, if you're here, I forgot your last name. Cass Akimoto, Yaron Janssens. We have a bunch of really fun, cool, good people giving workshops on September 1st and a conference on September 9th and 10th. We also are trying to host an in-person meetup September 1st, but unlike the conference, it is very hard to get a space to hold us for the meetup because a lot of offices are not really set with their opening plans. So if you have a space that can hold about 100 people on September 1st or 2nd, we would love to hold the R conference, the R meetup there that week to coincide with the workshops and the conference. So if you have an office space or a venue or any sort of space that can hold about 100 people, send me a message right away because we would love to have someone host us. If you are looking to attend the conference and just about any event we put on through this meetup group and you want to attend, use the code NYHACKR for a 20% discount. Any event that we organize, you can use the code NYHACKR because the events we organize are really for this group. You'll get a code, uh, you'll get a discount 20% by using code NYHACKR. Um, I see in the chat that Nicole posted, uh, the next meetup is August 12th with Ian Cook. And if you want to go and get tickets for the workshop and the conference, you could do so at rstats.ai. And by the way, the conference, it's in person, but it's also virtual. So if for some reason you're living somewhere you can't attend or you don't feel comfortable attending, you could watch it virtually. It's gonna use a platform called Hopin like we used this past year for the virtual events. It'll be really great. For those of you worried about attendance, again, if you are not don't feel comfortable, do it virtually. But we are following the guidelines of Broadway. Broadway is fully opening in September. And I felt if Broadway can do it, we can absolutely do it too. And for those of you that have attended before, it is in a much bigger space. It's gonna be much more physically comfortable. Uh, you can spread out more. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be really great. So for tonight's meetup, we obviously can't ask questions as we go. Um, we can't, um, you can't just all shout it out. So if you have a question for Sean, and I hope there will be a lot of questions, do your best to stump them. That's our goal today. We want to stump Sean, right? Uh, post them in either the chat you see right here and in, in Zoom or in the meetup, in the meetup Slack. I'm going to post a link directly to the channel in Slack. I hope this works. Oh, I got to send it to the right group. Hold on. If you send it to that, you click that link, that should take you right to the meetup channel. It is called monthly meetup chat and it's inside the NY Hackr Slack. So if you have questions, ask it in there, ask it in Zoom. And at the end of the talk, I will collate the questions and ask it of Sean. All right. And we are hoping that we're going to have a lot of good questions, a lot of fun. And uh, this is a very fun topic right now we have. So with that, we have, uh, I see a question from, um, there is a question coming in about fully vaccinated, anyone can attend. We are following CDC guidelines and New York rules about gatherings. And from as far as I can tell the conferences, it's open to anybody. Whatever Broadway's doing is what we're doing, okay? Just to keep it safe that way. But I will follow the rules as they exist, um, regardless of my proclivities. Um, but you want everyone to be safe. That's the most important thing. So we have a speaker who's been a longtime member of the meetup. He used to live in New York, came to the meetups a lot, spoke at the meetups, spoke at the conference. Um, I'm not sure even how many times you've spoken at all of our events. I think it's been multiple between everything. Um, so I'm very excited to have this very hot topic, causal inference, it's so hot right now. And I'd like to invite Sean to the stage to give us a rousing talk. And I'll virtually applause for you. Thanks, Jared. Really happy to be here, excited to be back. I think the last talk was actually quite a long time ago. So, um, so you're overdue. It's, it's definitely overdue. I'll try to get slides queued up here. All right. So th this is sort of like a pretty personal talk for me because um, I'm now about 10 years into my like official career as a, as a data scientist. And, um, and I, I was trained in, I, I did grad school in New York at NYU. 
And I was trained with economists. So I hung around with a bunch of economists and they have a certain aesthetic for causal inference. And basically it's that like, we can't even publish something if it's not identified. And that's a, that's a pretty strong perspective. And, and then, so then I had like 10 years of working on practical problems at companies like Facebook and Lyft um, and, and hearing about other data scientists at other companies and what they're working on and trying to figure out like, when am I supposed to apply this tool? Like, should I be as you know rigid as those economists are, or you know, should should I sort of like be more open minded about when it, you know when is the right time to use these tools? And so, I think it's a really interesting topic to think about, and it's very personal to me because I've become sort of this like causal inference guy. People associate me with forecasting from profit, and then also now with with causal inference, and and I have a very nuanced perspective on it. I don't think it's like I'm not like a Kool-Aid drinker in, in any way. I think that there's actually like a lot of interesting uh, reasons to use it and then th not to use it. So that's that's the spirit of this talk is to be like intellectually critical of, of these ideas and, and try to kind of explore like when, when should we be thinking this way and when should we be thinking in different ways. All right. So just to preview like my answer to this question is like there's two provocative answers that you could give like one is that you always need causal inference and the other one is never and I'm going to I'm going to do both so uh, that's that's the spirit of the talk is that I'm going to try to like take both both perspectives and you know there's a little bit of intellectual rigmarole to to, to make them both fit but in, in the always section I'm going to make the claim that useful all models are wrong but some are useful useful models are ones that tell us what we should do and um Telling you something useful involves like having a causal model. It just it just has to, and because you have to do something as a result of what the model says, and you have to model what the result of that is going to be. So in the always case, it's basically about pragmatism, and pragmatism yields sort of like a a, a setup where we always need causal inference because we're always trying to make something happen. Um, in the never section, I think I'm gonna it's gonna be even more prov provocative. I'm gonna take a sort of like strong stance on causal inference is just a tool. And so like, you know, maybe there are lots of cases where we don't need it. And in fact, like maybe all of the useful cases are ones where we can estimate what we could have estimated using causal inference tools through other means. And so this, this is maybe a little more provocative in the first section, but I think like, you know, also has a lot of pragmatism associated with it from, from my experience working in industry. All right, first section, we always need causal inference. So to, to start this section, I want to introduce my the data scientist's best friend, which is the conditional expectation function. Um, you may know this as scikit-learn or PyTorch or Keras or whatever you know your preferred function fitter is, but uh, we use it all the time in, in data science. This is the workhorse technology of data scientists. And I'm going to completely abstract away like the implementation details of how we how we get this thing. Um, but we, we use it all the time. And even when you do tabular data, like, you know, you do a group by and you compute means, like that's what a, that's a conditional expectation function too. We're always conditioning on things and always trying to estimate something from the data. So, so this is like a, a thing that we're going to continue to build on top of, but assume that your job is to make one of these functions. And just like for the venture capitalists in the audience, this, this is like this function and its existence and usefulness like suggests a, a set of businesses that you should invest in. <laughs> it's like feature stores provide S's, metric stores provide Y's. We like train models and produce the hats on the E's and then like we store and serve the models. So um, you could, you know, all these things should work together and they're all pain points for data science because almost everybody could relate to like one of these problems being a, a big pain in the ass. So when you work on conditional expectation functions all the live long day, there's a sort of like set of problems that you run into like as a, as a data scientist. And I think they sort of, there's a, there's a journey of, of, of things that you hit. So when you're early in your career, you think, oh, I need, I'm not using the right language. Maybe I'm not, I should be using Python instead of R or Stata doesn't work for this particular thing. Then you get onto like, you know, caring about packages or tuning hyperparameters or better feature engineering is like, you know, you're climbing up the hierarchy of needs. Um, and then like, I think really enlightened people are like, I just need better data. Data I have is adequate for the problem that I want to solve. Um, and I, I have lately been really interested in model evaluation. I think it's really hard and probably like even, even after you have all this stuff, do you know if you have a good model is a pretty hard question to answer. But at the very end of that is like, you just have a model, right? You don't have, you haven't done anything. You haven't made anything happen in the world. Um, and so like, you need the model to make something good happen. <laughs> and so conditional ex expectation functions are just a tool for like enacting some kind of like outcome that you would like to see in the, in the real world. 
And so the, we're, the next three sections of this talk, I'm going to give stories of like, you know, how the model can actually make something happen in, in, in different sort of like data science contexts. So story number one is about term prediction. It's sort of like almost like a, this is like hello world for, for data scientists. So, so what does this model look like? Uh, well, first we have like a label, which is like, you know, maybe the user cancels their account or we haven't seen them in 30 days or whatever. And then, you know, like S is just anything, it's anything in your database. So you can compute, you can create all these features about what they've been doing recently and, and, you're, and you're gonna build some great model. So I'm getting a bunch of chats. I just wanna make sure I'm not, okay. <laughs> Positive feedback, good. <laughs> all right, so we have this model, we fitted it. Awesome, gonna use this. Uh, and then like, there's a, there's a theory that you have when you build a model like this, right? You, you are like, you are doing the underpants gnomes business model of like, you have a model, there's some step where someone's gonna do something about the model with using the model, and then you're gonna like make more money. And it's very actually reasonable theory because you, you could just send them coupons and everyone's got this idea like, well, what are we gonna do with the term prediction model? We're gonna like do something about the scores. And then there's gonna be like a great business win there because we're gonna prevent them all from leaving instead of just like waving them goodbye, which is really all that model is equipped to tell you how to do. <laughs> um, and so like, I, I think that, uh, this is a, the second step should probably be part of the first step, and it's a, it's kind of a sub optimization to think of them as, as separate. So I am going to propose, and a big thesis of this of this section of the talk is that like these two activities of of business and of society are sort of like fundamentally intertwined in a way that we we have underrated, and that like you know thinking about doing good stuff in the world can inform how we should be estimating stuff. At, at the data science phase. And so like when we can tear down this wall, we can actually create like a joint procedure for doing these things. And, that, and then this would be a better way for us to be, for us to be working is like explicitly acknowledge uh, that, we're, that we're gonna need to do these things. All right, so well, how do we solve that problem? Uh, well, we add a new variable to the model and that model contains stuff we can do about the user potentially churning. Um, and so we have this like why, why SA? S and A are, are ordered in this way because this is the order in which they occur. S is sort of like information that we have available at the time we're making the prediction. And A is a choice that we make. And then Y is what we observe afterward. And this, this is sort of like a ubiquitous causal architecture for business is like we, we have sort of like collected lots of information. We're forced periodically to make some choices. And then we sort of observe outcomes that are associated with those choices. And we would like to, you know, form some conditional expectation of what would happen if we took different kinds of actions. This is a this is a counterfactual model. I didn't put any counterfactual language on it. Judea Pearl would really hate me for not putting a do operator on the A, but like let's just like we'll get to that in the in the next section. All right. So in this model, you are part of the model, and this is a really underrated aspect of modeling. Is I think that like when we're when we're trained as scientists. We are trained in this uh, very like it's it's the positivist re regime, right? It's like the you know the universe has certain laws, and we are meant to like learn them, and we are passive observers of of the of how the universe plays out. And so even when you write an academic paper, you, you some people will use like passive language, like the instrument was applied to whatever. And this is explicitly like you know removing the language of you being involved in the procedure. Like you are you are taken out of the context, and it's sort of like meant to be more objective. And I, I think I'm sort of like more on the other side of like let's just acknowledge that that we take a play, we take a part in the system that we're studying, and so that requires us to like put variables that represent our own behaviors and actions like into the model. So. Oh yeah, I was just joking around with like, well, the order of the S and A could be the other way. We can, we can make some jokes. All right, so we have S and A are our two right-hand side variables. And, and then this yields a very uh, useful kind of visualization, which is that what is the distribution of state action pairs that we observe in the data that we have. That we have. And so like, I call these uh, state action diagrams, but that yields a very like sad acronym. So we'll call them state action plots. And a very interesting thing about these plots is that they're not meant to show the full joint distribution of, of S and A. They're meant to show where we have positivity. So this is, this is a big assumption in causal inference is that we have sort of overlap um, between actions that we would, we would like to predict the outcomes of and actions that we have taken historically. So positivity is sort of like 
a necessary condition for us to be able to infer what would happen under that particular action given the state. We have to have observed it historically in the data. We have to, we have to have the ability to observe it. And so, so these lines, the green lines are showing where we have positive mass. So like where, where have we ever done this action given the state? So this diagram on the left is, is a very boring one, which is that we always take the same action, it's like not give the user a coupon. And so from this model, we cannot learn anything about a world where we gave them coupons. Uh, like there's, it's just not really in the, in the data for us to say. Um, and then this diagram over here has mass in both places, which means that there's a positive probability given any state of getting a coupon or not. And then in this world, for any user, we can tell what would happen if they got a coupon or not by using, by this is just like pure, pure induction. We can, we can sort of gather examples of users that are similar and when they got a coupon and when they didn't. And then we're able to kind of like perform this causal inference problem. Um, and this, this solves the estimation problem that we have. And so these, I'll, I'll refer back to these diagrams quite a bit because they're quite useful. Okay. So when you're in the model, you fit a model of what happens under coupon and no coupon, and then you use them and they suggest a, cor a course of action. This is commonly called a heterogeneous treatment effect model where there's sort of like different effects depending on some context variable. Uh, and so, so if we computed some retention score, we might learn like where the causal effect is the largest. So these are the highest incrementality people to be giving coupons to. So by fitting the right kind of model rather than the term prediction model, this model tells us like what to do, like who to give coupons to. And it also tells us like when the coupons are actually valuable or not. So there's some people for whom they're not very useful. Maybe these people are gonna leave like anyway. So it doesn't matter if you give them a coupon or not. And so it's sort of like silly to even, even do it. And then there are users where there's very high impact from giving coupons. And so we should give them to those people even though they look like um, you know, they're already like have a high probability of retaining. It's like the marginal impact is, is what matters. And so this is a model that's actionable. It, tr it translates like the business problem directly into a course of action that can be executed like quite, quite readily by an ops team. Whereas if I handed them like a set of term prediction scores, they would just take the top scores and just like we would have to hope that by coincidence, those are also the people with the highest incrementality. Okay, story number two. Forecasting, and I, I have like some history doing forecasting um, in my past job, and now currently at Lyft, my, my team works on forecasting. And um, working at Lyft has completely changed the way that I think about forecasting, and I, I think you'll you'll see that sort of baked in here. And it, it's it's because we have control over the forecasts, and it's very similar to term prediction. Is like forecasts are just sort of like status quo forecasts. There's a there's other other possible counterfactuals. So we have this normal forecasting model. It looks like this. It's this, our same conditional expectation function. We just changed the variable definition. So S is like what we have observed in the historical data. Um, and Y is like a set of observations that we will observe in the future. And so we, we, we fit models like this all the time. And we, we evaluate their forecasting performance. And we try to build ones that forecast things really well. There's, a, there's, there's like a, a couple important things that are missing from this model. One is the effects of stuff that we did in the past. So we committed to courses of action that might have impacts today. And so accounting for the effects of those past actions could improve the model. And so by like not including the things that we have historically done as actions and trying to kind of like anticipate what their effects will be in the future, we have, we have built a broken forecasting model. And then the second thing is stuff that we can plan to do to correct the forecast. So this is sort of like, you know, if the forecast says, things are gonna look really bad, we'll clearly do something about it. And then, then the forecast will be broken as well because it will sort of not include the effects of things that we have chosen to do in order to you know, correct the poor forecast and try to like, you know, fix, fix what, we, what we anticipate happening. So we have two kinds of actions that we'd like to incorporate. We, we need a causal model to do this. So here's a good example of the story that I just told, which is like, let's say at Lyft, we, we lowered prices and that happened in the past, but people take some time to respond to price changes because not everybody uses Lyft every day. Maybe, maybe it takes them like two weeks before their first ride and they notice that they see that Lyft prices are now lower. So we lower prices and then demand sort of like slowly creeps up. And, and this relationship is something that we can estimate from historical data. So we sort of have made price changes in the past and it's not impossible to incorporate this information about the price index into the future, into our, into our forecast. Now, demand going up means that we might not have enough drivers 
um, to meet the demand. So we have way more requests because prices are low. That, that would be really bad. People would be sort of like waiting a really long time for rides. And so we'd like to sort of engineer supply conditions that match the demand conditions in, in some way. And we have a tool to do that, which are called driver incentives, where we send offers to drivers to sort of encourage them to drive more during times when we have peak demand. And we have to make a plan for how we're going to set those driver incentives um, in advance, because drivers need to know, like, you know, more than just like right now, <laughs> whether they need to be on the road to like to help us like meet all the demand that we have. And so we have the, both of these causes need to be in the model in order for us to make effective decisions. We sort of need to know that demand is going to go up because we lowered prices and we need to know what we can do about it in order to fix it. So like I hate to use a like models that tell you what will happen, like great, but they don't tell you what to do. Then you still have, there's a still like a missing step. You still have to figure out like, what are you going to do about it? And that's a whole other step that you have like delegated to someone else. And I would say you, You've taken a very narrow view of your job if you if you sort of like forecast things and then just leave it to somebody else to use the forecast and like figure out what you're supposed to do about it. And I, I hate to use a Drake meme like in, in 2021. It's just sort of like toying with this state action notation. And yeah, like in 2021, I don't expect you to be laughing as much about it. Okay, so we have this causal model. Now the, the, the last piece, and this is sort of like, you know, completes the diagram of all the stuff that you need to be an effective data scientist is the argmax operator. <laughs> so argmax just says, pick, take the best action given the state and find, find me the best possible thing that I could do in this situation. And, and this is, this is a, this, just like the conditional expectations operator is like a beautiful abstraction. Um, argmax is a great abstraction too, which is sort of like, it's, it's hard to maximize things, um, but like, you know, assume that we can, we're all, we're all smart and we know how to run LBFGS or SGD or whatever. So we have a model already, we can argmax it, we can find the best plan. And this planning, optimal planning problem is sort of like baked into this model from the start. It is designed to admit solutions to the optimal planning problem. And, and this is what we do at Lyft. So we have goals that we'd like to sort of like achieve, and we are making forecasts that condition on information about what we will do about it. And the, goal, the goals are sort of changed, the, the results of the, of the actions change depending on state. Um, and so we can kind of like then take this and build an optimal planning procedure directly from the model. And, and so this, this is sort of like casting the forecasting problem as a planning problem, which is exactly what forecasting sort of like intended to, to do if you think about it. It's like, why, why are we building a forecast? It's because we think something's gonna happen in the future that we would like to respond to today and use that information in, or, in order to like make, take that action and, and prevent the bad thing from happening or make, make the good thing happen. Okay, so that was like act one, act two. Act three is ranking and recommendations. Um, so, so we've done term prediction, we've done forecasting, and now sort of like, this is like a you know, content recommendation problem. So picture you're like Netflix and you need to figure out what to recommend people or, or you're Google and you're gonna put some search results at the top of the page or you know, Pinterest is gonna list pins. This is just a ubiquitous data science problem. Um, and so like, it's also a conditional expectation function, right? So you're, you're, you're sort of like, even a recommender system fits into this framework. There's just sort of like things about the user and things about the item. And then we, you know, user clicking on the item is a pretty bad label here, but we might say like user like rates the item highly or likes it or you know, think, thinks, you know, watches the whole video on Netflix or something like that would be, I don't, I don't know what outcomes they use, but it sounds like you'd want to, you'd want to sort of capture something about like that, that the, the recommendation was valuable to the user as a label. Um, and so th this, this seems like a perfectly plausible model to fit, and it, it seems like it would be very useful. And, and in practice, people do ignore the causal aspect of this model quite a bit, sort of like that this, this data, this seems like a, like a reasonable approach to solving this problem. But everybody who works on recommender systems knows about position bias, um, which, which is that like we, oh, sorry, let me get to the position bias in the next slide. I just want to talk about just briefly like why we're worried about overlap. And we're gonna to get to overlap in, in, a, in a couple more slides for our state action space. Um, so overlap in the S distribution is something that we have to think about as machine learners. So, and, and this, this is related to like the cold start problem and recommender systems, which is like, if, if there are S's that we have never observed in our, in our training sample, and we're gonna make a prediction for them, it's gonna be a bad prediction because that model is forced to extrapolate to, to a, new, a new part of the S space. 
And so what, this is sort of like a, you know, knowing the distribution of your training data and your testing data and your prediction data and how they differ is just like a really common problem for data scientists to encounter and, and have to work on. And so like when you're working on non-causal models, we think about this all the time. So we're gonna to have to think about overlap in, in state action space. So let's go ahead and add the action to the model. And if, if you've worked on recommender systems before, you know about position bias. You know that like you know, changing the position of the item changes the outcome. And, and so like where you where you visualize it, where you display it to users will affect whether they attend to it and whether they're likely to sort of complete the steps needed to uh, to actually like you know get the benefits of the recommendation. So if we recommend something really lowly, even if it's a good match, like the outcome might be might be quite poor. So we have a role in generating the data that we don't really think about. And so like, you know, one solution to this is just to like gather the position data while you're while you're training the model and try to create some adjustment for it. But but actually it is a causal problem, sort of like we we have we have caused something to happen via putting um, recommendations in certain positions. And so the, the choice of the position is, is, a, is an action we get to choose. We get to choose a whole slate of positions. So really we're like, you know, we're talking about action being sort of a combinatorial set of all items and positions that they get, but we'll just abstract that for now and just say like, you know, let's just say like whether it was displayed to the user or not could be the, could be the position. Okay, so if we're building a ranking or recommender system, how are we gonna actually run that model in production? Um, well, we're gonna score all the items. And so we're gonna have this like score of the based on, which is gonna be just a function that we've estimated from data, but it's still historical. So it, it, it counts as state and it's gonna be estimated from the data and we're gonna score all the items. And then we're gonna, A is gonna be the, you know, how high up in the ranking they are, how, you know, probability of being seen by the user or something like that. <laughs> how high. It's a, it's a, it's an action that we take. And if we, if we built a ranking system with no exploration, this is what our state action diagram would look like. All the high scores get high positions. All the low scores get very low positions. And what's the problem with this is that the low scoring items, we will have never observed them in high positions and, and the high scoring items, we will have never observed them in low positions. And so we have sort of like a missing data problem. We have, we have never observed that action conditional on that state. And, and so that's gonna cause us to, to not know what would have happened in the case that we, so if we, if we fill in that model, we try to put in different positions for the item. We're not gonna get, um, you know, the, the variance of those estimates is infinite. It's sort of drawing on zero historical observations in order to make that estimate, even though most machine learning models would just spit out a score anyway. Um, it's, it's probably a bad idea to, to train a causal model on data that doesn't actually have any variation. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we add exploration to our, to our policy. So we, we and, but in, and exploration always looks like more mass in the state action diagram. So here it's sort of just like widening this line into a band is like local exploration. So this is like score position perturbation. We take the, you know, we flip a coin and or we add random noise to the score and then we re-rank things and then it sort of like generates some subtle changes in the ranking. And now we get counterfactual data. So we get sort of like state action pairs that that we wouldn't have gotten under the, the status quo policy. And, and a very clear implication for this is that this bears costs. So we, we are sort of like purposefully degrading the, the quality of our system so that we can build a better model that can hopefully yield a better solution in the future. So, so we're, we're sort of like taking a, we're paying a cost to build a better model that will hopefully benefit us. Um, but you can see what this is doing is this is, this is turning, this exploration is turning our model into something that can do a do operator. Do operator means that we can arbitrarily set the value of A uh, with, within, some, within, within some bounds, it, you know, if we, if we want a model that we can put in do A, then we need to actually have done that thing in the past in historical data. And so in a, in a pure explore regime, it's sort of like, you know, it's madness because you're, every item has a, has a positive probability of being in any, any position, um, which would probably look like a really bad recommender, but it would be really easy to, to model that causally because you'd have positive support for any action given any state. So what does overlap for team distributions look like in state action space? Um, well, now we have to like use little rectangles and I hate, I hate these diagrams that look like a flag of a country that I can't name. Um, and so like the way to think about this is like we have collect data collection policy, which is data we've, you know, we've gathered to produce our model. Then we have target policy, which is like policy we'd like to be able to estimate 
what will happen. Uh, this task is often called off policy evaluation. So if we, if we gather data under the yellow policy, we have no ability to estimate what would happen under the blue policy here because, because we've never observed those actions in those states. It's very similar to the yes coupon, no coupon version of the world. So, so taking more actions always yields like, you know, like expanding the set of actions that you take always yields a better, you know, better set of data because it sort of, you know, can answer more questions about more different actions that you could have taken. We can produce, uh, you know, cases of partial overlap where we can say something, but there are some kind of actions that we can't say anything about. And so there's, you know, there's models like this where like we're able to extrapolate a little bit, but not all the way. And then in a full overlap situation, we have like gathered data in this like expansive way. And then um, we're able to kind of any, any like data, any target policy that's contained within the set of positive, uh, pos you know, positive state action pairs is sort of like something that we can get an unbiased estimate for. So th this is a, this is sort of like in a way that the, the, the causal inference on easy mode, but it is a it is an important causal inference problem is that we like in, in the case where we have full overlap, we still need to figure out how to reweight the data that we have in order to kind of mimic the target distribution that, that we that we want. And so, so when I talk about causal inference here, I'm talking about like full fully observable confounding. And so it, it is a solvable problem and it's solvable through normal causal inference techniques. It just happens to be ones where we like have really good answers to the questions about how much bias is going to be introduced by that particular technique, which, which if we do the weighting right, it will be zero. Okay, so we've done term prediction. We've done forecasting. We've done ranking and recommendations. I've sort of, I think, I hope I've made the case that they're all like causal models and, and that they, if they're made causal models, we sort of have made explicit an assumption that we have made like that we haven't made, or we've sort of expanded the model to be able to answer more questions and more interesting and actionable questions than they could before. And, and that's a good thing. And it means that like, you know, that we, we have been able to uh, put ourselves in the model and make the models do things that we naturally need to do as data scientists, rather than just train something and like blindly get a prediction out of it. So let's try to like synthesize what we've, what we've learned into like more of a coherent framework. So fundamentally, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to propose here is that um, on the left hand side we have the machine learner's perspective, which is I can just like fit a model with state action pairs and outcomes, and and I'll just use that model, and that's fine. And that's the case where I don't need causal inference because I can just use whatever conditional expectation function that I want. And then on the right hand side, I have causal inference, which is like I have to estimate this function with the do operator, which means I need overlap and I need to choose some weighting algorithm in order to in order to adjust for the um, difference in the sampling between my training data and the test data. So just being aware of the state action distributions and then and then correcting for it for the target distribution that I have I have in mind. So when, when are these two things equal is when you don't need causal inference. If they're equal, then the machine learner and the causal inference person get the exact same answer to the question. And so causal inference was like a total waste of time for us. So, so really what we want to know is like when they're not equal, that's when you need causal inference. You can derive from, from everything that I just talked about, the two, the two conditions under which uh, this thing is trivially true. So it's, it's true either if you have no actions at all. So actions, the action set, is, is null set. And so we, we sort of like don't have any actions to take. And that's, that's a world where you can't do anything, but it's also a world where you don't need causal inference because those models are trivially the same. Um, so if you have no variables that you have any control over, then you don't need causal inference. Um, but I, I would argue that, so that probably never happens. <laughs> and then on the right-hand side here, we have the no confounding uh, condition. So if there's no confounding, then, then it's fine. That means that A, a is just, A is independent of, uh, of S, like they're completely, you know, completely independent variables, then yeah, you can just put them in the same model and, and you get like a reasonable answer to the, to the question of like, what will happen if you do A. Um, and, and this is true for like, you know, some design data that we might create like experiments and stuff like that. But it's not true if we used the state to select A. <laughs> which is extremely common. It was like, in what world would you take actions and not use some of the state information to choose the action? <laughs> um, that would be kind of crazy. And so like, so here's the, 
the diagram of like when you know when you need causal inference. So on the on the x-axis, I have control, which is the size of the set of the actions that you can take. And we could even operationalize control in a more precise way, which is like you know the, the total effects that we could generate from the set of actions that we have available. How much power do we have as people operating within the system? Do we have the power to make anything happen? Is really the question that we have. And then on the y-axis, I have like amount of confounding. And here it's like fixable confounding through causal inference methods. But when we have when we have confounding, we need to use something that looks like causal inference methods to, to correct for the way that the sample that we've gathered is different from the sample that we would like to estimate, which, which is sort of like that do operator. So, so what happens here? And the, and the control is very low. There's nothing to do. So I'm going to argue, if you don't have anything to do, then it's not really, you know, it's not a valid case. <laughs> Then in the case where we have zero confounding, it's just we just ran like a pure randomized experiment. So we, we could argue whether you should do that or whether you should just skip to this like contextual policy optimization. Um, or maybe we can just count randomized experiments as causal inference to begin with. But either way, this is the this is the realm of where you need causal inference. If you're going to do anything and you're going to use the state in order to choose the choose what you do, then you need causal inference. And I think that that's mostly all the time. <laughs> all right. That's the that's the the end of the always argument. Cool, how am I doing on time? All right, section number two, we never need causal inference. This is gonna be like intellectually more, more challenging for me to do because I think I was more, previously more aligned with the first one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like kind of uh, first draw the DAG. You haven't seen a single DAG in any of this so far. So I, I purposefully kind of like kept out all the DAGs. <laughs> that was, and that was on purpose. And like, there's this like fun meme on Twitter, which is like hashtag draw the DAG, where you tell people to draw DAGs of things that don't make a lot of sense. Um, but it is very useful to take like what I was just showing you and draw DAGs of it. It, it just sort of like, um, DAGs are useful and they're a great tool. And I, I think that everybody everybody should learn them. But let's let's go and draw DAGs for like what we, what we were just doing. Um, so the three DAGs on the top are, are very reasonable data generating processes that you might encounter in practice under the model that I, that I just described, where sort of like we can condition on two variables, like you know, state and action, and then we can generate some outcome as a result of the action that we take. So randomized experiment is where we just don't even have condition on state, and we just sort of like actions are chosen randomly, and they affect the outcome. So don't need causal inference for this. This is a stupid DAG because it's very boring. It's just it's just saying sort of like we did something and we observed the outcome and we can just like take difference in means to compute effects. In the second one, there's no confounding because S is, A is chosen independently of S. So this is also quite, quite a boring setup. The S is just providing like variance reduction for the, the effect of A on, on Y and sort of like maybe you can you know use a heterogeneous treatment effects model here or something like that. So but it's, you know, there's no confounding, so you can use machine learning would get you a reasonable answer here as well. And then on the right, we have like the case where we observe the co co confounders and use them to choose A because we operate the system that chooses A. Um, and so we do need the do operator here, but, th but this DAG is also quite boring, right? It just says that there's confounding, but we can fix it is what the DAG tells you. Um, it's like, you know, A is confounded by S, but we can condition on S and block the backdoor path. And so there's really no identification problem at all. So, so these are all special DAGs where A is a parent node, pure parent node, except for in cases where it isn't, it has a parent that we, can, that we also know about, right? So we know the treatment assignment mechanism perfectly. And when we know the treatment assignment mechanism, we essentially know the distribution of P, P of A given S, which, which, is, which is this arrow here. We don't need any fancy causal inference tools to, to, to apply to these DAGs. They're all sort of like solvable with like pretty standard statistical techniques. So, so the DAGs themselves are sort of like stories, but they're not very interesting stories and they don't tell us much about what we should do. They actually, they actually sort of like end at a point where the interesting part just gets started, which is like, how do we analyze the data that we generated under a DAG that was created like this? Now, if we have a confounded DAG, which is like, you know, all observational data has this like potential that there was a variable that you didn't observe that affected what action was taken. And this is super common in the social scientists, like, you know, humans take actions based on information that they have that we can't get out of their heads. 
And, and so we just don't know this U and we don't know what the set U is. And so we don't know what to condition on to block the backdoor path and uh, debias the estimate of the effect of A on Y. So what do we know? If we know we don't control the, the treatment assignment mechanism, it means that we don't know how the action was chosen. It means that the confounding could be arbitrary. We can get an arbitrarily wrong answer here. I mean, sure, there's lots of work on sort of bounding how wrong we could be, but, but, but it, it is a sort of a case where we don't control it. We couldn't have controlled it. We don't know how it was set. And, and, and if we try to analyze the data, we're, we're, gonna get it, we're gonna get a wrong answer. <laughs> so the answer is, the question is like, when should you use observational data to, to take actions? I, I would argue like potentially the answer is never. <laughs> Um, because we should just use experiments and, and try to like stick to the DAGs on the top and, and solve the kinds of problems that we can get good answers to. And this is a super strong perspective and I think I don't even fully believe it, but let's, let's talk more, we'll, we'll get to more about like, you know, what, what, what role the DAGs are playing and why, why we might think about confounding. But I, I think one, one reasonable story is that I'm gonna use the, the understanding that I get from this to like suggest an action that I will test using one of the top DAGs later. But I, but I sort of like, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable argument is that I, I can like generate some knowledge that a human can then use to go design an experiment that might actually uh, give us a, a well-identified estimate. So people who like DAGs love to talk about mechanisms because, you know, it's one of the great things that they can kind of help provide answers to. So, so in the case here, we might say, hey, like A caused Y and we got a really clean estimate of that from our great experiment that we ran, but did it cause Y via mechanism M1 or M2? And, and that would matter because I've got this other treatment that it's laying around and it operates through mechanism M1 or M2. I have action A1 and A2, and I'm gonna decide like which of those two things to work on. You can think of these like, you know, maybe like ads, like, you know, this was, this was a super effective ad. Did it appeal to, you know, their sense of belonging in our community or did it appeal to their need for technical features? And if, if it was like the other, the latter, then you would want to sort of like develop an ad that was different. Um, so it's, it's super plausible that you, you would want to use your knowledge of the effect on the mechanism to, to kind of like generate a new action from intuitions. So maybe, maybe like DAGs are useful, at least in the case where we want to do that. So we can tell, like, there's a little interesting story, and I highly recommend reading the article. It's it's super super interesting, like epistemologically. It's like the and it's it's become a parable at this point, but th there is a really interesting story about it. The, the lost cure for scurvy, and and so scurvy is like a disease that you get when you're on a ship for a long time and you don't have access to vitamin C. We know this now because we have great research and have done a lot of science on it. And, and people go on these long journeys and not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, get scurvy and has terrible symptoms, by all accounts, a horrible disease. And you know, they, they learned that consuming lemon juice cured scurvy, like it basically prevented anybody from ever getting it. And you could like, it could be operating through like either vitamin C levels or like, you know, maybe just delicious citrus fruits are the kind of thing that cures scurvy and some other mechanism that we don't know about. So, so a bunch of British sailors go on a trip and they, they take lime juice because lime, limes are just like lemons, right? And then they put them in copper tanks exposed to the air and it like, you know, uh, destroys all the vitamin C in the juice. And so this lime juice like tastes like juice, like, and it tastes like the, what they were taking before, but it doesn't have vitamin C anymore. And so it doesn't operate on the same mechanism um, and it doesn't, it doesn't cure scurvy anymore. I should have just removed this arrow from the diagram. <laughs> so that, you know, that doesn't work. You know, you can't you can't use that treatment. And so, if if we knew, if they knew this mechanism was important and they knew that lemon and lemon juice had vitamin C and lime juice didn't, then this is valuable knowledge, right? You would you would know that this like this what this thing wasn't going to help you on your on your trip at all. But like you know, I'm going to take the experimentalist perspective here and say like, okay, like we could have just. Lime juice is just the new action, right? And so you just assume you had no positivity when you just put people on a ship with lime juice and said, you know, it's going to be good, just try it out. Um, and you never tried it before, that would be a bad idea, right? Like you're kind of like trying a new action without any, any inferential ability to say what will happen there. So the experimentalists would get this problem right too, right? Like, you know, if I, if I were just sort of like testing new cures for scurvy and I, were, I had a good experimental design, knowledge I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to just like 
it cures scurvy without experimenting on it first with with you know with some kind of like positivity in that part of the distribution where we try lime juice and estimating this outcome. Um, and fun fact, like the isolation of vitamin C wasn't until 19, 1932. So we didn't even know what vitamin C was until like 200 years after this anecdote, or sorry, the, the anecdote is like 1911. So it was like 20 years too late. They knew what, um, they knew what vitamin C was. So even if, even if like you had to wait even to understand what the mechanism was, we had to identify and measure the mechanism. These are all cases where like uh, you could still get the right answer without knowing this by running experiments, or you wait until do all this costly research and find out what vitamin C is. And also, also that humans just like can understand like why it worked, but you could, you could have just gotten the right answer and had something that worked like without doing any of that science stuff and having humans been in the loop in any way. So just kind of like int interesting thought experiment there. So the, the big claim of this section is that like those DAGs that have action as the parent node that I control is just experimentation. It's where I get to like take interventions myself and choo you know, choose the value of certain variables in the system. Experimentation is a proven architecture for accumulating use useful causal knowledge. Now it doesn't mean that it tells us like why things happen, but it does tell us like what will happen if we do certain things, which is sort of like maybe the most important thing that we can do in a practical setting. So if we're looking for a useful causal knowledge, then I would argue experimentation sort of obviates the need for DAGs. And that in many cases, the DAG is just sort of like a story that you tell uh, after the fact, but the experiment was the thing that really gave you the answer in, in the first place. The DAG didn't give you the answer. So, so this, is, this is a relatively strong perspective, but if you have the ability to experiment, um, which, which I hope that you do if you're doing things that you, if you have control over the system anyway, then, then adding randomness to that is a very natural next step. And then, then you're in a world where the DAGs are not super useful anymore. So this is my like, you know, bear, bear case for causal inference. <laughs> but I will say that actions have to come from somewhere. So we, we put like coupons, coupons came from, you have a theory in your head that like people like discounts. And so there was like a, like a node in the graph that you had in your head, which is like um, the like the cheapness of the product, and you and you had this idea that cheapness of the product was going to like cause people to be less likely to turn turn from your product, um, and that's a human intuition. And so maybe, maybe like human design is sort of where actions come from, and, and that's a very reasonable role for causal inference. Is that if you have a dag in your head, and it may suggest sort of like things that you want to you want to apply as treatments and then we will go run an experiment on that but that but you're still using a dag and causal inference as like a you know jet hypothesis generation engine I, I can get behind that and i think that that's relatively reasonable this is the most important when the feedback loop is really slow so why do we need human design it's because humans have good priors they're bringing a lot more information to the table than a model would have available and so yeah like by all means you know humans design experiments that's that's what we do we sort of like pick new product directions we pick we pick designs, um, we, we choose like whole bundles of things as actions rather than just like A, B. And before, and the A and the B test is actually like a super well-designed and engineered thing that we're comparing against one another. And, and, and so that's a slow feedback loop. And so sure, we, we need human design and humans need to solve some sort of like speculative causal inference problem in order to, in order to do that. But there is a world where, hum, where machines can design the action space and, and that's very reasonable as well. And in, humans have a role here too, which is to create a hypothesis space for machines to explore. Um, and this can be this can be many things that don't you know come to mind very easily. So like, like a whole app or website can be parameterized into like how big are buttons and what color are they, and what position are they in, or or you know text or movies can be parameterized <laughs> in various ways, like star you know stars Tom Cruise or stars someone who looks like Tom Cruise are like factors about a movie. So you can design a movie parametrically. <laughs> Um, if you wanted to, and and then uh, you know, then it's just about how fast can you test it and get feedback about whether that set of parameters corresponds to like a successful outcome. And in a case where you have a feedback loop that's fast, then I think I would argue that machine exploration of action space is probably in generated in machines generating new actions is is probably a much more efficient way to do it because they'll be able to kind of generate candidates more effectively. So if you have a well parameterized space. And you can get fast feedback. Then, then we don't need humans to design actions anymore. And so, like, this is the world where, like, you know, AI can can automatically generate actions and automatically test which ones are good. And so, like, you know, humans 
don't really have a great role anymore in that one. Um, we can talk about whether that's a good thing or not. <laughs> okay, that's a good segue into like, I just, I just articulated like a causal architecture that actually sounds kind of terrifying, right? It's like, you know, we, we've given machines sort of like actions that they can take and we're like trusting this, like, you know, these systems to, to operate safely. So, have, you know, maybe we haven't learned anything. Like if we, if we give systems the ability, like AI to the ability to reason about causality, then it can do things like this, like, like articulate that, oh, this is why my robot uprising failed. And then like, I'll send a terminator back in time to uh, prevent that from happening. <laughs> and then, you know, there's lots of additional consequences from that. Like Kyle Reese comes back and make sure the Terminator doesn't kill Sarah Connor. And then, then Skynet becomes self-aware because of that. And all right, this is, this is all nonsense. Um, actually, this is the problem. It's not robot uprising, it's this, it's, we are going to apply this maximization operator and maximizations are kind of terrifying if you think about them because they're sort of like, they're going to find everything that's wrong in your model. So if you maximize something, then you better damn well be sure that you're maximizing the right thing. <laughs> and it's optimization technology is really probably the scariest piece to this because it's sort of like it's hill climbing and you have to have chosen the hill correctly. And I made this argument quite a few times about metrics like choosing metrics and whether you're optimizing the right thing. And I, I do think it's like a relatively ill-considered aspect of data science. Um, and it follows naturally from that data science, you know, pathway that I was, I was showing you in the, in the first couple of slides, which is that you, st you start with, I need to make something good happen. But like the very next step is I need this to not do something bad. <laughs> it's like, cause making something good happen might have some consequence that we didn't anticipate. So controlling and managing risk of models that act in the real world is, is a really important part of, the, part of the process. And then naturally, if you have bad things and good things, like both of those things are going to happen sometimes. And so you're going to need to actually manage trade-offs. And so, you know, you need to get, if you, if you live in a world where you're going to use algorithmic decision-making, then it, it strongly implies that managing trade-offs is like first order concern for you because ma maximization needs to sort of have something to kind of like pull it back from over exploiting. And then very naturally sort of like someone's got to help you, you have to come to a consensus as an organization or as a society about where you should be on the, on the trade-off curve. And, and so th this, this is the path that we're seeing play out and we're, and we're going to see more of it because we're, we're building systems that like can, can act and do things in the real world. And so like they're, they're going to be based on causal models. They're going to be able to optimize. These are all like known working technologies. And, and we're really gonna need to start thinking really carefully about these next couple boxes. Um, so, you, you know, you started the journey at the very beginning of this talk of like, should I choose Python or R? And the end of the journey is like, am I gonna like enact this the collapse of society through, you know, creating a model and some optimization and some action space that, that can do that kind of thing. And I, I do think that that's the kind of responsibility that you should be thinking about first um, and all, all the whole way along. Okay, so what, what have we omitted from the model and why, why is trust and trust and response, why is safety and responsibility so hard? It's because the model's misspecified. Um, the actions, perfectly well specified. We, we know those because we control them. The state space, you know, we, we could be missing features. That's sort of like a well-known problem. But the why variable we have not talked about at all. She's like, what is why? Where, where, where did we get it? Like, is it the right, is it the right thing to be optimizing for or, or estimating in the first place? And, and to be honest with you, I don't know many people that think really hard about the whys in their models. It, you know, it's, it's sort of like common to use the thing that's conveniently available. And it's also common to just use one thing um, and, and, and sort of like forget about trade-offs. And so what I would push you to do, if, you think, if you're thinking about safety and responsibility, it's all about what you put into that why variable and how many, how many things you consider and whether they re represent the needs and risks to your, to your stakeholders. And so you can kind of picture how this plays out is if we, if we sort of only measure one thing and why, and it's a good thing, then we're going to maximize the hell out of it. And we're going to end up here. And if there's a trade-off between why one and why two, we get, we end up at this point. Um, and so th this, this curve are all sort of states of the world that we can operate in. So we can, we can choose from among these possibilities. These are all like, this is called a production possibilities frontier in economics. Like we're, we're able to like choose a point on this curve and, and get what we want. 
we have to choose it. And that's a sort of like an important question for, for any business or, or society or organization. It's like, where, where do we want to operate? How much of this bad thing are we going to tolerate? And, and for whom or will, we, will we tolerate it? Maybe, maybe the value of this changes depending on the state as well. All right. So just to sort of slowly wrap up here, um, I hope I've convinced you Causal inference is useful in a lot of settings if you define it a certain way. And also sort of like maybe, maybe some of it's a little overblown. Like maybe you don't need like all the all the fancy causal inference stuff all the time because there's there's ways to structure your problems and your data collection and, and the way that you operate that, so that you, you, you make the problem easier and you don't need kind of all the fancy machinery that causal inference can provide you. And, and that's just sort of like a, a standard story that tools, tools are just, tools and they're useful in certain settings and not useful in others. And so that there's nothing really super surprising about the fact that you might sometimes need causal inference and sometimes you don't, but, but it's the, it's the consistency part that I think you need to just like, you know, you, you know, not to always use the same modeling technique because there are some that might work better. You know, you shouldn't be just as consistent about, you know, applying causal inference strictly all the time when you don't need it or, or not applying it all the time because you just don't think that you need it. And I, I, I read this, this quote was really good. And that it actually sort of has this like, with consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. Um, but it, you can invert this the other way as like having nothing to do and no action space yields a great amount of consistency for, for you as a, as a person. So like, it, it's actually quite easy to simplify and make a really consistent career as a data scientist if you just don't do anything. Um, but I, I would argue that it's really hard to have like a productive and successful career if you don't think about the consequences of, of that simple conditional expectations function that you're that you're working all that time to make good. So just to conclude, um, I'm, I'm claiming you can do most of data science with three variables. Now we can make them tensor valued or you know very high dimensional or whatever, but it's really ought to be enough for most business problems, which is like we observe a state, stuff we know, stuff we can do, stuff that happens. Like that's that's a fundamental architecture. Um, if we are careful to design the data generating process correctly, where we where we explore actions based on states, then we only really need very straightforward causal inference to learn everything that we need to know. Like we we don't need anything fancy at all. I mean, the, some of the modeling techniques are fancy and interesting, and they, they have their own sort of interestingness. But we, we don't really need like DAGs or super complicated identification arguments in, in this setting. We sort of are, are capable of engineering a system that, that can answer questions with relatively routine statistical um, analysis. And DAGs are, are useful tools, but they're more useful for humans. Like they're useful for us to tell stories and to help us determine um, like what things might be happening in a system and for us to reason about things. Uh, but but they're sort of like you know in in this particular regime, which is a which is a very flexible and it covers a very broad array of data science problems. Um, they they sort of like we can mostly omit them and, and get away with not thinking about them. And just to kind of like I I I, I refuse to do anything super technical in this talk, but I'm going to provide all the pointers that you need. If you if you want to know more about everything that I talked about. There's so many different topics that I touched on that like that, like every little detail, like how do we estimate the conditional expectation function with, with causal interpretation is a super interesting problem. How do we sample actions given states and how do we do that adaptively is a super interesting set of problems. How do we like perform this maximization problem? Um, and one of the things we've been doing on my team is using differentiable programming to make models that are easy to optimize <laughs> And that's been like super, super fun and interesting to see how that plays out. But also like, you know, that argmax requires, you know, designing metrics and estimating trade-offs and eliciting preferences from users. So just like a ton of interesting questions in there and research topics. And then like, I, I didn't talk about variance like one time in this whole talk, which is like, you know, maybe you also care about the variance of that estimate and like whether you're likely to be right. And that's sort of like in a risk management setting that would be really first order um, that you care about sort of like minimizing some downside risk or you care about like this is uh, this is like very Bayesian and I didn't talk about any uncertainty or you know even even gathering sample size at all here but it's it's a super interesting problem of like how would you estimate how wrong you're likely to be in that conditional expectation function so so these four topics like fundamental to uh, th this like nascent field of like what I what I'm calling causal engineering 
Um, and, and there's plenty of pointers there and I'm happy to, happy to provide more. So with that, I'll stop and take some questions. So thank you very much. That was terrific. I'm gonna give you a uh, golf clap and I hope everyone else in the chat can do it also. Um, we miss the times where people get like a nice big applause then, uh, from the crowd. It's always great in person. This would have gotten a huge applause if we were in person. So please accept my verbal applause as a big crowd cheering for you. We had, Thanks, uh, we had a, uh, some questions come in, but feel free to ask more questions, folks, as I ask the questions and Sean answers. Uh, please feel free to chime in. Yeah, so, um, I think that was Ken, but I'm not sure. She said excellent presentation. Not a question, but still nice to hear, Ken. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Great slides. Um, speaking of your slides, that uh, VC focus slide was really <laughs> great. Um, I really appreciated that one. And I will be, uh, I already tweeted a photo of it, so I need to actually tweet an actual <laughs> real still of it. Um, that was I, just I just posted the link to the slides in the. Um in the in the chat too you can share it in the slack i'm not in the slack group yep i'll share this in slack and then we'll also we'll be posting the actual slides and the video up at nyhackr.org um hopefully within the next few days we'll have that up there so everyone just check out nyhackr.org there's a very crappily written page presentations page up there you can actually search for sean's name you'll see this talk in his previous talks um and by the way, if anyone wants to redesign that, it is open source. It's on GitHub at github.com slash nyhackr slash nyhackr. Please redesign it. It was built pre-Hugo, pre-blog down, a straight up regular markdown. Please redesign it. I, I, I can't stress that enough because I designed it and you can see my aesthetic for there. It just wasn't working. So I really want someone to redesign my personal website. So any, anybody who wants to help me with that. <laughs> is it available publicly on GitHub? And that's it's on GitHub. GitHub, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can make a PR for you too. That's perfect. All right. So we had a, you know, a few things come in. And let me just, I saw one come in. I see two. OK, great. Um, here's a question for early on. And you did touch upon it later, but you know, that was a good question. Um, am I wrong in thinking that the last slide, I don't have the reference for you, but the reference, hopefully the question will give you context. Am I wrong in thinking that the last slide bore similarities to Bayesian optimization, except now we're trying to build an active causal learning algorithm that can determine the optimal sequence of interventions? Yes. Yeah. A lot of this is inspired by um, things like banded algorithms and contextual bandits and Bayesian optimization. Um, and, you know, like one of the things I didn't touch on at all was like, how, how, how often do you change the P probability of A given S? And so banded algorithms change that as the data streams in. So I, I would call that like an online learning algorithm. But you can do you can do these learning things in batch. So you can just like wait a month and then re, you know change the distribution. And then so you, so so it's a little bit a little bit tied in with bandit architecture, but it doesn't need to be. So th these things can be you can run sequences of experiments and that can approximate what a what a bandit does. And Bayesian optimization is just sort of like bandits for continuous variables, one way to think about it. Bandits tend to be sort of focused on discrete discrete action sets, but in many cases you have continuous ones. And if you want to learn more about bandits, uh, go to that aforementioned poorly designed webpage and search for Shane Conway and John Miles White. Uh, they've both given bandits talks and so is Emily Robinson. Her talk wasn't necessarily about bandits, but it was about bandits. Um, and those are the three that come to the top of my mind. And I know I like to particularly mention Shane and John because they are members back when uh, back when Sean was living in New York with us. Big big fan of both of them. They're they're pretty awesome. Um, you mentioned about Judea Pearl be mad at you for not using the do notation. <laughs> Can you get more into that? Like why it's such an important thing to have the do notation? Yeah, I mean. Um... Today, Pearl is a really smart guy and has done a lot of great work. And I, it's very, I, I found it really inspirational to, to borrow ideas from, from his work. And um, the, the do operator is important. It's sort of like, it is important to specify like what can be estimated from the data, you know, and uh, the do operator fundamentally tells you like, like that it, it is a different thing you're estimating when you want to set the value of a variable than when you want to condition on it. And, and set, you know, setting means that it can be set to any arbitrary value um, given given S, and that, that's different than like you know just whatever value nature gave you for that thing, and it's it's a fundamentally more useful useful thing to know. Um, I think he he takes a pretty strong view that like not not putting a do operator in from the start means that you are um, 
you, you are doomed to never be able to solve the hardest problems <laughs> of causal inference. So, so like what Judea, if Judea Pearl were to, were to give this talk, he would say, you always need my causal inference because I, I will show you causal inference problems that you can't solve using, uh, you know, using anything but what I have designed. And I, I think my argument is something like, actually, there's a simplified set of data science problems where you really don't don't need all of that machinery and it's much simpler than that. And so like, so if you wanna solve all these hard problems, sure, like, yes, I have not encountered those problems personally as a data scientist. So uh, so like, so that's why I think he might be a little mad about this, but you know, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big fan of his. I, I do get into arguments with him on Twitter, but I think everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he's open and engaging about it too. We would love to have him speak one time here. Um, it's, for, it's a shame he's not at NYU. He's at NYU a long time ago. We'll try to find some way to get him involved. Um, speaking of Judea Pearl, I'm going to give you a leading one. Um, some of the best books you've seen for um, learning causal inference? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I, I think that there are some good ones that sort of are focused on the scientific application of causal inference. Uh, so, so, you know, there's um, causal inference mixtape, Scott, Scott Cunningham is a more recent one and um, they're, they're mostly harmless econometrics is quite a good one for economists also, uh, you know, Pearl's book, Pearl's book of why or, and they're, they're all give you very different perspectives on it. And I, I think that a lot, in a lot of ways, this talk is a response to the fact that I, I have not seen good materials about like how to apply these techniques in practice. Like the, they often sort of teach you like little parables, like, you know, smoking causes cancer. And so you learn these little stories, but they don't tell you like, oh, how am I going to use this in my job? <laughs> how am I going to get something done? And I, I do think that we're missing a little bit of effort there. And the, the causal, causal inference and machine learning intersection is just starting to take place. I mean, some people would argue it's been taking place for a long time, but I would argue practical tools are just starting to emerge there. Um, and so I, I can't point to any specific resource there. There, there, are, there are some really good researchers out there that are kind of at the forefront of this. I think um, one of my favorites is Nathan Callis, who's a researcher at Cornell Tech um, and you know, doing really good work. And some of the keywords you might look for there are like off policy evaluation is really important. Contextual bandit optimization, also sort of fundamental to this and Bayesian optimization also fundamental. Um, Eitan Bakshi's group at, at Facebook, he's a, he's a good friend and, and they do awesome research. You can go to like axe.dev and find out a lot about adaptive experimentation, which is really sort of like a, um, an engineering approach to what I just described. And um, Sean has just learned that he'll be giving a how-to of code in a few months at a future meetup. So <laughs> he'll choose his favorite language and then teach us all. Yep. <laughs> um, how do you, uh, and if, uh, folks, if you need those resources, maybe Sean, you could just uh, tell us later the, you know, some of those books that you, know, you mentioned, think... mixtape. You know, there's a recording. Causal Friends mixtape, the question of book, book of why, ask.dev at Facebook, and you might have mentioned one other thing you want me to sing about. I'll, I'll write it down. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Because I know this will be very popular afterwards. Um, let me see. Oh, here's like sort of a follow-up question that you, I'm going to give it to you anyway, just because um, you sort of already answered it. Is there an accessible reference paper or open source code for applying causal inference to a forecasting problem specifically? Yeah, that's a much harder question. I, so using causal ideas in forecasting is actually has a historical precedent that goes back quite a long ways to mac macroeconomic forecasters. I used to work at the Federal Reserve Board and that, that's sort of like a first order question is like, what should we set the interest rate to, to make sure that the economy grows fast, but not too fast. <laughs> and, and that's, so putting themselves in the model was sort of like very early in, in macroeconomic forecasting, um, especially for central banks. I don't have any papers at hand that I can I can point to, and in fact, like I think most of their there's a lot of good ideas to borrow there, but I don't know how particularly practical they are, because macroeconomic forecasting has to face this sort of like uh, they worry about the people in the model optimizing in in response to their decisions. So it's a game theoretic problem. You have to sort of solve for an equilibrium, and so it's a little little different in nature than things where we can assume that people aren't smart enough to optimize in response to what you're going to do. Um, so I, we have we have 
we have coded up most of our stuff in PyTorch and have built forecasting models that have causal components. One, one of the kind of key concepts there is what, what's what we call a causal, causal convolution. So convolutional neural network is really great for two-dimensional images, right? Sort of like moves a little window across the image. But also a 1D convolution, which is like a sliding window across um, an input wave. And so what, you, know, you can think of your policies as input waves and convolutions as the effects of those waves. And that's an idea that we've used and gotten a lot of leverage out of. Um, I don't have like, I don't have any resources. We built a bunch of stuff, but it's sort of like all in house. Um, I, I hope we get to write some blog posts about it someday soon. So it would go beyond like putting an exogenous variable and something like profit. For instance. Yeah, profit, profit cannot do this. And so I haven't, yeah. <laughs> if only you, someone could fix that. Yeah, well, I think it should be something new. I think um, profits at profits close to feature feature complete. So well, maybe there'll be a new package someday that can do that. You got to come up with like a profit in another language that way. You know, do some <laughs> other language. Um, all right. Wait, no, I wanted that. That's just about to ask that one. Um, how do you distinguish between confounders and prognostic variables? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so prognostic variables are pr predictive of the outcome. Um, and so they, they can be used mostly for what's called variance reduction, which is like, you know, you're explaining more of the reason for the outcome from, from the S's. So then it allows the variation that's due to the actions that you take to be, to be easier to, easier to see. Um, and confounders are variables that are, are like, kind of like also having an effect on the, on the action itself. And really the reality is a lot of variables are kind of like both. <laughs> Because if you're if you're using these the, the actions to choose what to do, then you and they have some influence on the um, on the outcome, then they're probably a little bit of both. Now, knowing if it's a confounder is like is your business, right? So if you, I, I would, this is a strong perspective, but if you're taking an action in your business and you don't know what contributed to it and you're not logging it, then you're sort of like making a fundamental mistake that's going to prevent you from learning in the future. So people call this exposure logging or. Um, but like, you know, building a good logging system that captures like the why that you took actions and, and if there's a randomness in it, which there should be, then you need to have logged that as well. Um, so the, yeah, the answer is like, whether it's prognostic or not is estimatable from the data, whether it's a confounder or not is something that you have to know from, with domain knowledge and have, have sort of either like engineered or assumed. Great. And I guess sort of that knowing um, things um, is a question about, a lot of job postings right now are focusing on languages and packages and ML models. Do you think there'll be more of a push toward having these calls inference skills in the future, and in the near future, or do you think it's going to be more just about, you know, implementing? Yeah, that's, a good, that's another good question. I mean, I, th I think that, so on the one hand, we're really lacking people in causal inference skills um, in industry, and it's, it's very hard to hire for. Finding people with prior experience is challenging. So I, I, I would encourage everybody to learn about it and get experience because it, it will make you more marketable. I would like to hire you if you're really good and know a lot about causal inference. So I, I hope <laughs> I hope people are willing to take that on faith. Um, I do think that some of this stuff is going to turn into the realm of engineering in the future. Just like it's the same arc for a lot of machine learning systems is like, you know, do, do we really need humans building models? You know, eventually hyperparameter tuning is, is automated and feature engineering is automated. And so I think some of the causal inference stuff will, will sort of tend toward engineering systems in the future. And so the, the role of data science and causal inference will become a little bit less, but, but there, we're, we're much earlier in that cycle for causal inference where there's still a lot of human domain knowledge that's needed to solve these problems in practice. And it's much less automatable because there's a lot of like assumptions that are needed by humans in order to make these things work. And the, and the modeling architectures are just more complicated. Um, when you're jointly modeling actions and states, you, you need to treat the actions differently. I, I abstracted this completely in the in the talk, but actions are fundamentally different kinds of variables and need to be um, fit differently than just like standard features in a machine learning model. It's very inefficient to fit them, you know, just as like other kinds of features. It's, there's a there's a large literature on that, and um, knowing how to do that is very useful because you get a lot more precise information about what's likely to happen under certain kinds of actions. So, so I think it's a really deep area to learn. It's very useful to learn. It's probably gonna be a great job skill at a lot of places. All marketplace companies, like, uh, you know, uh, any place that sort of like operates a marketplace is very concerned about causal inference because they care a lot about like what they can do to cause the marketplace to, to function more efficiently. But um, uh, it's, it's not going away and there's gonna be a lot of jobs, I'm pretty sure. And uh, speaking of jobs, someone just wrote in a little bit, a little bit ago. How did you personally decide between academia and industry? 
how I like uh, didn't get sleep for like three months of my life and <laughs> was a miserable wreck. Uh, no, I, I had a I had a really good experience in, interning at, at Facebook when I was in grad school. And I, I was like, I was in New York at the time and I, I came out to California and um, I, I felt like an in industry, I was learning very quickly because I was exposed to this constant stream of problems. So, you know, being a consultant, it, um, internally at Facebook, working on what you know what was coming up there, was a little bit of a preview of the future. You know, you were seeing the kinds of problems that companies were going to have, like you know, way before the industry, way before the academic researchers were thinking about them. So I, I always felt like um, I was learning so much faster there that like I would choose a job where I learned quickly more than a job where I wasn't learning very quickly, and I had kind of tapped out on what I, what I could learn from reading papers and being in seminars and stuff like that. Uh, I still miss my academic life and I do miss sitting down and writing papers and it's, it's pretty tough to get that anywhere else. And if, if you really do like having open-ended research problems and a lot of space and bandwidth to, to work on them, then it's, it's pretty hard to replicate that in industry. So, so you can't, it's not just a free lunch, but, um, but it was a tough decision. And there's a, there's a world where I'm like a professor struggling to get tenure right now that I'm like a little bit terrified of. So. <laughs> So no, no looking back with regrets. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question I've, I've asked of you before in the past. I'm glad someone else asked you again. Yeah. Um, and calling back to something you actually mentioned when you talked about the, when you worked at the Fed, um, does causal inference have any difficulty incorporating deliberately adversarial behavior into the model? Like, how do you account for that? Yeah, it's a, it goes, it's a really good question. Um, you know, typically we're at the, we're in the world where we don't think about that too much because, so, okay, here's a good example, like lift, lift coupons, right? So we like, we give out coupons, we use a model to do that. Um, and you might think like, oh, I could figure out like what the algorithm is and like, you know, do the kind of behaviors that cause lift, lift to give me coupons. And we, we should be, we should be worried about that. And that's, that's the thing that like, you know, get, you know, gaming the system so that you, you produce the kind of features that get you benefits. Um, and there is some literature on that. I know um, his name is escaping me right now, but uh, there, are, there are people who work on that that kind of problem. I, I think we have like relatively simple fixes for that, like rules-based systems that help make sure that people can't exploit things. But I do I do think that there's a there's a probably a bunch of open-ended research questions there about how to sort of like make what you're doing you know robust to when when the user gets to set s. <laughs> In your model, and they have some control over it, then you have you don't have full control over your system anymore. That might be a reasonable way to think about it. Um, and so it, maybe maybe there's maybe there's some ways to kind of like provably fix that problem, but I, I doubt it. I bet that that just adds a lot of waste. Um, and you just mentioned S. We have a question that was actually asked a while ago. How do you know that your experiment is a good match for the S values that you observe? Ooh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so one of the things, so the diagrams that I showed, the state action diagrams are, are like a kind of, they're just, they're just theories, right? They just say like, where could I have done this? But they're not densities. Um, they're not showing like where you did collect the data. And one of the interesting things you can do with that diagram is assess balance, right? So ba balance would say like, how much is the distribution in this action similar to the distribution in this action, or you could frame balance the other way, which is given the state, what was the balance between the actions, but really what you care about, care about is the balance in the state given the action. So we invert that probability distribution and we can check that those two distributions are, are similar. And it, you know, if they're not similar enough, then it means that there was something that failed about your randomization. So that people sometimes call those randomization checks. Um, and uh, I, I know that a lot of researchers are really interested in like producing like automated versions of these checks, like maybe there's ways to verify that your causal inference system is likely to work by just checking that you gather the data that could answer the question. So you can do positivity, which I showed there is actually like an empirical quantity that you can, you can estimate. So you can say like, could my model actually make a prediction about this? Was there a positive probability of ever observing me doing this with this state in the past? And if it's zero, then your model is going to, it's going to return an answer because <laughs> all machine learning models produce, except for the very honest, uh, K, you know, K-means, or sorry, K-nearest neighbors is the most honest model because if it's if there's a cluster really far away, then it, it was sort of like, you know, there's no, no data nearby, it will, it will be very honest with you. But most models won't be honest, they'll just sort of return an answer. 
So I, I think like distribution overlap and whether the distributions are capable of answering the data that you collected are capable of answering the questions that you have is a really fundamental thing. And it's it's check, it's checkable mostly, and it just all has to do with like common support and, and density, which are things that you can estimate. And I know in the past you know, you've been you've used stand and built some stuff and I'm particularly profit. Uh, if you're doing Bayesian stuff today, are you using Stan or using PyTorch? So PyTorch has been used for MCNC sort of. Yeah, so I, I had like omitted variants from this whole this whole talk. Um, I love Bayesian models. I think it's a really powerful methodology and you can get a lot out of it. It's also really slow, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, so you spend a lot of time waiting and, and there's, a, there's a sort of like a feedback loop for researchers, right? You want to try a new model change. So you, you have to kind of make, move some things around and, and Bayesian models are, are, are very fragile in that, you know, if you specify things in an incorrect way, you know, they'll, they'll find that very quickly and it's, they'll, they'll be wrong, but they'll take you a long time to tell you that they were wrong. <laughs> and, and I think that we just decided early on to, to not pay that cost and kind of move a little faster and not actually deal with uncertainty in a principal way. Uh, and I, I think if I could go back in time, I'm not sure if I would do that again. I think that there are, there are big trade-offs there, but um, I guess the hope is that the neural network frameworks like PyTorch start bolting on better inferential capability over time and that you can get it for free and not have to, not have to worry about it so much. But um, there's lots of frequentist kind of uh, uncertainty estimation. I, I had a bullet on my slides about conformal inference. Conformal inference is a very powerful tool that you can use and you don't need to, um, you don't need to have a full posterior. You can still get like prediction sets for, you know, for predictions that you're making. So there's, there are other tools, but I, Bayesian models are just like slow and hard to, hard to scale. So we've had some challenges using them in practice. Makes sense. Right. I do know um, scaling, you know, a lot of these neural networks are um, used on GPUs. Stan actually recently is now able to be worked on the GPU. Um, it's a new feature. So, and there's the speed ups are dramatic, probably not as fast as you need, but that is, I'm very, I'm very excited about that. You know, I, I think the, that team is amazing. And I, you know, they, they do awesome work. And I still think Stan is like the only like ground truth, like estimator. I would always believe, a, you know, yeah. The posterior I get from Stan over like anything I did myself. So it was very valuable to, to see them making progress there. And I, I do hope that someday it's just as fast as anything else and we don't have to make any compromises. But I think, you know, the, the world as it is, is that we have to like pick somewhere on a spectrum. of <laughs> Fully Bayesian is the most expensive yep. modeling that you can do. It's sort of like, you know, or it's a, time and effort both are very expensive for that one. I like that, that you're right. It's both time and effort. It is both are involved in defining your model and doing the fitting. That's actually really great. All right. So I think that was all of the questions. I was looking around to see if anyone's messaged me on any of the screens I have open. And it looks like that is all of them. So I want everybody to knows where to find me. So, you know, happy to answer other questions. Actually, you know. please tell them where to find you in case anyone doesn't know about you on Twitter or anywhere else they can find you. Yeah, you can you can connect with me on Twitter. It's just you know my name, but without the period in it. Um, and uh, and yeah, always happy to chat about this stuff. I think it's really interesting. I, I think I think it's uh, exciting because it's a bunch of unsolved problems, and I'm really looking forward to like this becoming like these ideas becoming a more full fledged like part of, you know part of data science. And I'm also really looking forward to people just sort of like learning about the basics of causal inference and getting started on it because it's it's just like a super fun way to think about what you work on and think about the world. Great. So thank you very much. And everyone, please tag them at Sean J. Taylor. Um, you know, be in touch. Let everyone let them ask me questions or you know, just say hi and say thank you. Um, and I'll say thank you for being here. And thank you for all the cool stuff you built. And I look forward to one day, hopefully soon, seeing you in person. And um, have a great time. And I'm going to give you a golf clap on behalf of everyone else. And hope that everyone enjoyed this as thoroughly as I did. I see a lot of comments in the in the comment section saying thank you. So everyone's telling you thank you right now. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your time too. Thanks, Jared. Yep. And everyone, I'll see you next month at, on August 12th for Ian Cook in September at the meetup and at the conference in person. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>